On today's Monday Night Travel, we're joined again by travel writer Cameron Hewitt, who will be guiding us through the Balkans. Starting in Dubrovnik, we'll explore Montenegro's fjord-like Bay of Kotor. From there, we make our way up to Bosnia and Herzegovina to appreciate the vibrant, diverse city of Mostar. Thanks for joining us. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Monday Night Travel. My name is Ben Green, and I'll be your moderator tonight as we explore beautiful Dubrovnik and nearby highlights. I would now like to turn things over to our host. Cameron Hewitt is our Director of Content here at Rick Steves Europe. He's also a guidebook researcher and has co-authored several guidebook titles, including our guidebook on Croatia and Slovenia. So please join me in welcoming back Cameron Hewitt. Good evening, Cameron. Welcome once again. Hi there, Gabe, and he hello to everybody at home. Thank you for having me once again. It's always great to be back on Monday Night Travel. Good to have you back. And Cameron, I understand you have a special drink this evening. I wanted to kick things. This is a, a pretty hefty show. There's a lot of serious themes, but I wanted to kick things off uh, on a festive foot. And I have a special drink I got on my last uh, trip to this area, to Croatia, Dubrovnik, which is about a year and a half ago. This looks like a bottle of wine, and it was produced by a vineyard in the Pelješac Peninsula, which is right near Dubrovnik, a vineyard called Gugorevic. But it's not wine. It's something called must. When they make wine, they first mash all of the grapes down into must, and they sort of start to kind of macerate it, and uh, it's not quite fermented yet. In this case, they have this cool product where they uh, reduce it. So it almost becomes, and it's not alcoholic. It's not fermented. So it is sort of the essence of the grapes from the wine that they've turned into almost like a sweet syrup. So it's kind of like a non-alcoholic shot that you get to do. But look at that. It's almost brown. In fact, in Croatian, the word for red wine is not red, it's black. So no, it means black wine. Um, so I'm just going to cheers. Jiveli is the Croatian cheers. Jiveli to get things off to an auspicious start. And we'll try some of this concentrated wine must. Mmm. Ooh. It's such a rich, complex flavor. Yeah, it tastes a little bit like grapes, red wine. Almost tastes like raisins because it's so concentrated. Uh, this is just one of wonderful, the many wonderful treats that we get to enjoy when we're traveling in Croatia. So I'll be sipping on this while we watch our show together tonight. Um, as Ben said, um, I'm very happy to be with you here. I've, for among many hats I wear at Rick Steves Europe, I'm the co-author of our Rick Steves Croatia and Slovenia guidebook. So I get to go to these countries quite a bit. In 2007 or so, uh, I took Rick when we had our first edition of this book. He and I traveled together in this region so he could kind of get to know what was in the book. And he fell in love with it all over again after he traveled there himself when he was younger. And so he said, let's come back. In 2009, we came back and we filmed three shows in this region. And it was a, it was a fun shoot. It's the first time I was actually involved in the shoot. I worked with Rick and with Carl, our camera operator, and with Simon, our producer. We traveled around this area for three and a half, four weeks. I wrote the first draft of the script and then Rick and I worked together on it as we traveled to make sure it was exactly what we wanted. And it was really fun being a fly on the wall for TV production. Uh, out of that, we came out with three shows. There's a show on Slovenia, there's a show on Croatia, and there's the show we're about to watch together called Dubrovnik and Balkan Side Trip. So kind of all of the rest of Croatia is in a separate show called Croatia. And I was telling Ben and Gabe before we started, all of the kind of fun cultural stuff, I think, ended up in the Croatia show. This show is actually pretty serious. This show is really about this region and the full complexity of not just Croatia and Dubrovnik, but the former Yugoslavia. It's kind of a microcosm of the former Yugoslavia. So it's going to be a really interesting show for us all to watch together. By the way, this was just the first of many great trips I've had with Rick and the crew. In fact, just last summer, we were off filming uh, new episodes in Iceland and also new episodes in Poland. So keep watching your public television, stay tuned. Those shows will be coming out in the next year or so. In fact, I think our, our Iceland show will be out. We'll have a one hour special as soon as this fall, I think. And just so you know, the cast of characters, you're only gonna see one of these guys on the show tonight. Rick, of course, is on the left, but every scene of this show was accompanied by the guy in the middle, Simon Griffith, who's our wonderful producer. He's produced every single episode of Rick's TV show from I think 1999, 2000. And there on the right is Carl Bauer. He's the camera operator. 
who's probably filmed about two thirds of the Rick Steves show. We have other camera operators we work with as well, but he's there for an awful lot of them. And this was the crew. This is all we have when we film these TV shows. It's just the three of them. Sometimes they let me come along to help carry the gear uh, and tell them how to pronounce these crazy Croatian words. Um, so that's, this is sort of uh, our chance tonight to kind of get a behind the scenes look at what it's like to film this TV show um, and to learn a little bit as well. Uh, what was really interesting before we get started, I'll just give you some context. So this is a show on, we called it Dubrovnik and Balkan side trips. And we'll start off here and you'll get sort of the whole context. Um, but the what's really interesting, a couple of things interesting about this. First of all, this show was about 15 years old. We filmed it in 2009. Um, so there's, you know, some of the fashions are a little bit dated. But what was really interesting is a lot of what will come up in the show was the wars of Yugoslav succession, the Yugoslav wars that took place in the mid 1990s. And when you think about it, from when these wars happened until when we filmed it was about 15 years. And from when we filmed it to now is about 15 years. So it's been now 30 years, about twice as long from when we first filmed it. And I have to say, we worked really, really hard and conscientiously to try to cover this very complicated topic thoughtfully. And I'm kind of happy with how it's aged. Hopefully uh, you'll agree. But I think as I watched this back, I thought, you know, this, this captured a moment in time 15 years ago. Um, but in a lot of ways, it really feels relevant for today as well. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. And if you've never been to one of these, the way it works is that uh, I'm going to be, we're going to watch the show together and I'm going to pause from time to time and chime in. Usually I'll be giving either a little behind the scenes sort of filming, like little stories from what it's like to film these TV shows, or some context on how we decided to do it the way we did it, why we did it this way and not that way. And in a few cases, I can kind of tell you what's happened in the 15 years since we filmed this, because while a lot of what you see here is still pretty similar to what it's like, there are a few things that have changed as well. So let's kick things off. Rick Steves, Dubrovnik and Balkan side trips. Hi, I'm Rick Steves, back with more of the best of Europe. This time we're jumping, well, actually he's jumping for maximum travel experience in Croatia, Montenegro and Bosnia. Thanks for joining us. So that's what we call the cold open. It's the it's cold because there's no introduction. You just start right up. And we're always looking for something kind of fun and exciting for the cold open to grab the attention of the viewer. In this case, we knew we wanted to show one of these divers jumping off the old bridge in Mostar, but it was a little tricky. They were a little squirrely. They didn't want to do it too many times. Um, you'll see that same clip again later, in fact. It was really hard to get uh, several versions of them doing that big jump. Um, and so we were glad that we got that one to kind of grab everyone's attention. All right, Rick's going to take us now and introduce us to Dubrovnik. The Balkans, that troubled southeastern corner of Europe, is complex and relatively untouristed. Exploring corners of Croatia, Montenegro, and Bosnia, we'll get to know the three major groups of former Yugoslavia, Croats, Serbs, and Muslims. And we'll toss in a little fun in the sun, too, here in Dubrovnik. After a splash of Adriatic resort life, we sail a Montenegrin fjord and share the rewards of peace in Bosnia. We see three local religions in action, Orthodox Christian, Roman Catholic, and Muslim. Then we head to Mostar, where we'll finally get this guy to jump and dine with an inspiring backdrop. The places we're visiting were all part of the former Yugoslavia, which broke apart in the 1990s, splitting into seven countries. We're visiting three of them, Croatia, Montenegro, and Bosnia-Herzegovina. From Dubrovnik, at the southern tip of Croatia, we venture to Montenegro's Bay of Kotor before exploring the Serbian part of Bosnia and finishing in Mostar. Well, that's just a quick rundown of what we're going to do in the show tonight. And man, that's when you think about it, that's pretty ambitious. You can kind of see what I'm talking about. We did all the fun stuff in Croatia in the other show. And this is where we're going to kind of dig into the meat of the different regions, these now different countries that used to be one big country. But this is a place, as Rick just said, that has three different religions just within a two hour drive of Dubrovnik, three different religions, three different uh, cultures, three different attitudes. Um, in a lot of ways, I feel like this episode is more like one of Rick's Beyond Europe episodes. If you follow Rick Steves at all, um, he does a beautiful job. He did a great show on Iran, which they filmed around the same time they filmed this one, Simon and Carl and Rick. Um, they've done, he's done a show on the Holy Land, Israel and Palestine. He's done a show on uh, fascism in Europe. He's done a show on um, uh, hunger and hope, uh, looking at global poverty issues in Ethiopia and in Guatemala. 
And even though this is part of our regular public television uh, series, and it's really a travel show, of all of our 30 minute travel shows, this is the one that feels to me like it's kind of halfway to one of these very special episodes. Um, so as, as we go through, I'll be, I'll, I'll be interested to kind of point out a few places where this is a, not just a fun travel show, it is, I hope, but it's also a pretty serious, thoughtful, educational look at this very complicated and often misunderstood region. By the way, in this next shot we're about to see, there's some flowers that are in the side of the frame, just so. Just remember those flowers because we'll see them again later. And now I'll leave it to Rick. The springboard for our Balkan adventure is Dubrovnik. With its dramatic setting, it deserves its title, Pearl of the Adriatic. Confined within its walls as it has been for centuries, Dubrovnik juts out from the rocky Croatian coastline, looking inviting from both the land and the sea. Its central promenade is the heartbeat of the city, a thriving people zone. It's a multi-generational celebration of life where everybody's out enjoying that Mediterranean knack for capping the day with an easygoing stroll. Dubrovnik is very touristy, and understandably so. Even with all its crowds, as anywhere, backstreet charm is just a few steps away. Stepped lanes help you imagine actually living here in an age before tourism dominated the economy. And I think that's a very important point if you're traveling to Croatia anytime soon. As crowded as it was in 2009, Croatia, especially Dubrovnik, is even more crowded today. But this advice still holds true. Um, a couple of reasons why Dubrovnik in particular has become super popular even since we filmed this. One of them, I think I mentioned already, the cruise passengers. Uh, we have huge cruise ships that come in and drop off thousands of people every day in Dubrovnik. The other thing is a lot of Game of Thrones, a lot of the scenes of Game of Thrones were originally filmed in and near Dubrovnik, which kind of sparked this whole new wave of a different kind of tourism. And for all of those reasons, Dubrovnik is extremely popular and extremely crowded. Um, but I will say the tip that Rick just gave is exactly right still to this day. The street that Rick is on here one of my favorite little B&Bs is right on the side of that street, this beautiful plant-lined lane. And even to this day, if you're in Dubrovnik on the busiest day of the summer when the main street is so crowded, it feels like a mosh pit. You can't even walk across it. All you have to do is walk a few steps up one of these side lanes, and it's almost like a miracle. Suddenly, you have the whole place to yourself. So that's still really good travel advice. The town's imposing architecture is a reminder of its former glory. In the 15th century, the salt trade and shipbuilding made Dubrovnik a maritime power and rival to Venice. The Sponza Palace is a fine surviving example of Dubrovnik's golden age in the 15th and 16th centuries, combining both Renaissance and Venetian Gothic styles. Stepping into its stately courtyard takes you back to that illustrious age. Through clever diplomacy, Dubrovnik managed to maintain its independence until the 1800s. Through all those centuries, the Republic of Dubrovnik invested mightily to withstand any siege. They stockpiled grain in huge underground silos and piped in water from nearby mountains. Dubrovnik's single best attraction is its mighty wall, offering an unforgettably scenic mile-long stroll. While constructed over many centuries, today's impressive fortifications date from the 1400s, when they were beefed up to defend against the Ottoman Turks. And I'll just note again, if you're looking for travel tips for Dubrovnik, what Rick said then is still every bit is true. Walking around, there's a walkway that goes all the way around the top of that beautiful wall. It's still the best attraction in town. It can be really hot and crowded at midday. So it's another thing you want to do either early or late. And it's gotten a lot more expensive. It used to be $5. Now I think they're up to about $35 or $40 to walk around the wall. But it's totally worth it. So that's just an absolutely delightful experience to walk all the way around the perimeter of this beautiful old town on top of those stone walls. While the walls worked fine against the Turks five centuries ago, they couldn't protect the city from modern artillery. In 1991, after Croatia declared independence from Yugoslavia, the Yugoslav army shelled the city, damaging about two-thirds of its buildings. Brighter, newer tiles mark the houses that were hit and roofs that had to be replaced. These roofs were rebuilt using the same materials as the original ones. When the war engulfed this beloved city, the world paid attention. Today, as the new tiles are fading, 
so are the scars of that war. We're staying at a small guest house at the top of town. Throughout Croatia, sobe, that's rooms for rent in private homes, are a much better value than big hotels. Ours is run by Pero. Pero, tell me about the war here in Dubrovnik. Well, it was a very difficult time. So Dubrovnik was under siege for eight months. So no water, no electricity, no food, medicine. And all the refugees for, from all those smaller places around, they came in Dubrovnik, hoping they would not dare to do such a thing to Dubrovnik, right? What happened to this house specifically? Well, this house was hit by two grenades from mortar, right? So this is what I find in my, uh, on the top of my house. Two of those explode. So house was hit, no tiles, I, so I could see the sky. There's no, no roofs on the house. And this house? This house is more than six century old, and it's in my family for more than 200 years. So I took some loans in the bank, and I decided to rent it like, uh, like a guest house. So now it's the tourists are come back and you have a good business. Yes. And a beautiful right. house. Congra the, the quality and the craftsmanship is just beautiful here. Thank you very much. So I wanted to say a few things about Pero, who we just met there. First of all, it's, it's really humbling and a rare experience, I think, to talk to somebody in person who has survived, lived through a war. And so to have an opportunity to, that's something you get in, in this part of the world that you don't get in a lot of parts of Europe, at least which is probably a good thing for in most cases, but it really helps deepen your understanding of what it's like to actually live through a war, to talk to someone like Pero and to hear his own experiences. So we felt it was very important to share that story. And then coming up later, we're going to hear from somebody on a different side of the conflict and their experience of living through the war. Um, the other, th a couple other things I wanted to mention. One is that the way that Rick makes these shows is kind of an interesting, what you just saw was a really genuine conversation, but it was kind of staged. And what Rick likes to do is, when he's filming, or not filming, when he's doing guidebook work, or when he's just traveling around, he's always getting ideas for TV shows, and he'll have a conversation or a little encounter, and he'll think, this would be great for TV. And so then a year or two later, he comes back with the film crew, and he'll kind of do almost like a dramatic reenactment of the same conversation. And that's exactly what you just saw there when I was uh, in this area with Rick a couple years before we filmed. We had that exact conversation with Pero. The only difference was it was pitch black. It was late at night. We had just driven halfway across the country. We were staying at Pero's place, so we showed up late. And we stood in that same room, and Pero offered Rick a glass of walnut grappa, which you saw us drinking at the beginning, and then uh, proceeded to tell his personal story and talk about his house being bombed and picking up the mortar shell. All of that happened exactly as you saw it. It just happened a couple of years earlier. So Rick, when he produces the TV show, he, he knows kind of what he has in mind, and it, sometimes it involves reenacting something that really happened, which I think is a really interesting way to, to make TV. And it works really well, as you can see. Um, the other thing I just wanted to say, Pero is one of a lot of wonderful people that we feel really connected to through our work at Rick Steves Europe, that every so often they get their moment in the sun and they kind of get the spotlight and they get to tell their story on television like this. He's one of many, many wonderful Croatians that I've gotten to know over the years working on our guidebooks. Uh, and it's such a treat to be able to introduce people like you to people like Pero. Um, and I'll just tell you a little bit more about Pero because he's such an interesting story. So as Rick uh, just heard from Pero, he opened this guest house after the war. And I happened to stumble into his place when I was working on our Croatia book early on. And I could tell it was really great. In fact, I stayed in that room that you saw Rick lying on his bed working on his laptop. I stayed in that same room when I was at Pero's place a year and a half ago. Um, so he's still doing this. In any event, I found this great place and I we, we told him, hey, we've got this guidebook. I said, you know, I'll put your name in my guidebook. You'll get a lot of Americans coming. And a, a lot of times the first time you do that, they say, oh, yeah, whatever. OK, sure. You have a big popular guidebook, right? Um, but in this case, I said, OK, well, you'll be there. And sure enough, the next year, he, his phone started ringing off the hook with people like you using our guidebook to stay in Croatia. And I came back to update the book and he said, look, I can't handle this anymore. He said, there's just too many of them. But I have a friend across the lane who's got some rooms as well. And the friend's name also happens to be Pero. So there's two Peros. There's Pero number one and Pero number two. And you can see Pero number one, who you just met on the right there, and his across the lane neighbor, Pero number two, also had some beautiful rooms. So I put Pero number two in the book. Pero number two started to fill up. And then they had another set of neighbors, Anita and Ivana, 
who are sisters who had more rooms. So we put them in the book. And so now there's this little pocket of rooms at the top of this step lane, just from where you're standing on the main drag there, you just walk up the lane and we've got them all listed in the Rick Steves book and have for many, many years. And I can't even imagine the hundreds, thousands of people, tens of thousands of people who've been able to stay with Pero and Pero and their neighbors when they go to Dubrovnik. Um, and it's been fun for me to go back when I update our book every edition and I get to reconnect with Pero and Pero. And just on my last visit in, in a year and a half ago, I was walking up that step lane and sure enough, I didn't, this was not staged. There were Pero and Pero sitting there saying hello. And my favorite moment on this trip, and then I'll go back to the show. I just got a kick out of this. Um, I was talking to Pero number two, who's the one on the left. That That's no indication of their quality as human beings. It's just the order in which they were added to the guidebook. But uh, anyway, I was talking to Pero number two and I said, well, I need to check the information on Anita and Ivana. Are they around? And he says, you know, let me know. I, I don't know for sure. Let me call them. He says, let me call them. And he stepped down into this lane and he put his hands to his mouth and he says, Anita. <laughs> and sure enough, Anita's head popped out the third story window across the street. And that's just what we love to plug people into in our guidebooks. This idea that there's this very small community of people in Dubrovnik who are all neighbors. And now all of our Rick Steves people get to stay with them when they get to, get to these places. And so that's just a little a little behind the scenes of what it's like to, to be a part of that, that universe when you're traveling. All right, I'll shut up for a while and we'll learn a little bit more from Rick about Dubrovnik. With the war in the past, the tourists are back. To escape the crowds, hit the beaches during the heat and crush of midday. Go for a dip near or far from the old town. Wherever you choose, you'll swim in the shadow of one of Europe's finest fortified medieval cities. And evenings in town are peaceful. A hole in the mighty wall leads to a great little bar called Bouja, just the place for a romantic sunset. Clinging like a barnacle to the outside of the city walls, this tranquil getaway is the perfect place to appreciate this city's extraordinary setting. That's such a beautiful way to finish our time in Dubrovnik. And I'll just mention this, this cocktail bar we just saw. Uh, it's called Cold Drinks Bouja. And Bouja is the word for hole in the wall. And you saw you literally go through a hole in the wall to get to this bar. And that's what that's called for, Cold Drinks Bouja. And it's another great example of these wonderful discoveries that we get to make for the guidebooks. And if we're very fortunate, eventually they end up in the TV show. And then more and more people get to have this beautiful experience when they get to go to Dubrovnik. All right, we are now going to move on to our next of three countries. We've, we've done Dubrovnik, and now we're going to head into Montenegro. From Dubrovnik here in Croatia, two other countries that were once part of Yugoslavia are each just an hour's drive away, Bosnia and Montenegro. And that's where we're heading next. Montenegro, where towering mountains meet the Adriatic, is both scenic and humble. One of Europe's newest and smallest countries, it's about the size of Connecticut, with well under a million people. It's a country of contrasts, an intriguing combination of rugged landscapes, communist-era decrepitude, and an emerging Mediterranean hotspot that's quite popular with the cruising crowd. I'll just mention quickly um, that idea that it's popular with the cruising crowd. Montenegro is a really fascinating place and it's, it looks kind of similar at first blush to Croatia, but it's very different. And one of the ways it's different is it's it's very, very poor. There's, a, there's It's not a very strong economy. And yet it's very attractive to an extremely wealthy version of, of the of tourist. And in fact, a lot of uh, Saudi money and a lot of Russian money has poured into Montenegro. Even since we filmed this, there are two brand new super high-end luxury yacht harbors that are within a couple minutes drive of, of this main town in, in the Montenegrin coast. But it creates this strange, you know, if, when anytime you go to a place where there's a lot of poverty and then a lot of really expensive tourism, there's this weird cognitive dissonance. There's this gap where the infrastructure of the place you're in doesn't quite sustain the, uh, the fanciness that's expected. So I'll just tell you very quickly, when we were filming this episode, a great example of this. The Montenegrin Tourist Board put us up at this boutique hotel and superficially it was beautiful. Uh, Carl and Simon, I remember they we walked in and they were like, this is like the fanciest place we ever stayed. 
It was nestled just off the road in kind of a jungly area. Beautiful, pristine, uh, ornamental, very palatial feeling place, right? But very quickly we figured out that that was a facade. And in the fact, the rooms were just gigantic, but they were really odd. So I remember Rick talking about how his bathroom was bigger than most hotel rooms he'd stayed at. And yet they'd squeeze the toilet and the bathtub into one little corner of the bathroom. So it was impossible to sit in the toilet without jamming your knees against the bathtub. And then I remember we were there, as you'll see, as we show the rest of this, we had pretty rainy weather when we filmed in Montenegro. And at one point we, uh, there was a horrific thunderstorm. We were all in our rooms getting ready to go out and shoot. And it was just sheets and sheets of rain. We came out into the lobby and it was just bedlam. There was water gushing in. They had these really fancy glass sliding doors. There was water gushing in through these glass doors and the, it was raining so hard it was making the doors open and close. And this poor receptionist was had this broom and he was trying to sweep this that massive volume of water out. Meanwhile, the power all went out. Um, and the, this poor guy with the broom, he looked at us and he didn't have a lot of English, but he said one word, he said, cows. <laughs> And uh, we said, "Did he say? Did he say cows?" And and Rick said, "No, I think he said chaos." <laughs> and it's true. And I think it's a really interesting example of this is what happens when you have a very poor place and very expensive tourist tastes. It doesn't always work very well. And I think, interestingly enough, fifteen years later, Montenegro is getting better in that regard, but it still struggles with some of these same issues. All right, that was a bit of a tangent. We're going to get back to Montenegro. Montenegro's Bay of Kotor is an easy day trip from Dubrovnik. Its fjord-like cliffs rise out of the Adriatic, surrounding ancient towns packed with history, all tied together by a twisty road. The narrow mouth of the bay, easy to defend yet deep enough for big ships, defines an ideal and strategic natural harbor. At the Venetian-flavored seafront town of Perost, locals ferry visitors out to a man-made island that comes with a fascinating story. 500 years ago, local fishermen found an icon of the Virgin Mary stranded on a reef right here. They spent the next two centuries sinking old boats and dropping rocks every time they sailed by, eventually building the island and the church, Our Lady of the Rocks. The church, with its legendary icon above its high altar, is festooned with symbols of thanks for answered prayers. Countless votive plaques. Bouquets and ribbons from happy brides married here. And paintings of ships engulfed in storms. These were commissioned by sailors who survived thankful for Mary's protection. Tucked among a clutter of nautical artifacts is a delicate treasure. This embroidery was a labor of love created by a local woman. For 25 years, she toiled using the finest materials available, silk and her own hair. The cherubs show the years passing as the hair of the angels, like the hair of the artist herself, went from dark to white. Humble and anonymous, she had faith that her work was worthwhile and would be appreciated, as it is two centuries later by a steady parade of travelers from distant lands. And I just wanted to mention that piece that we just saw, that beautiful embroidery where the color of the cherubs changed as the woman who was making it aged. She was using her own hair, and as her hair turned gray, the, the hair of the angels turned gray. That's my favorite type of sightseeing in Europe. That's my favorite thing to discover in Europe. And I want you all to think about for a moment, there's a piece of art or, or a little detail that you stumbled upon in your travels that was not by anyone famous. We don't know the name of the woman who even created that tapestry. It wasn't created by someone famous. You're never gonna find it in a textbook. You'll almost never see it on a TV show or even read about it in a guidebook. But I think if, if, if you're very fortunate as a traveler, you do find these little moments where something small like that just stops you in your tracks and takes your breath away and, and you find it very personally moving. And I know that, that that tapestry that Rick just described for him on that first trip, we would, went to uh, this area sort of scouting for this show. I remember we were doing a tour of this island. We were seeing all the stuff and taking notes and we kind of blitzed past it. And Rick told me the next day, he said, you know, I can't get that tapestry out of my mind. I have everything we've seen and done here. It's almost like haunting him, you know? So 
I just wanted to call out, I think that's the joy of travel. It's not going to see the big famous cathedrals or the big, you know, textbook pieces of art. Sometimes it's those little intimate moments that you encounter in your travels. So just as we continue to watch, just think through your own mind, some of those, I, I'm thinking of a few of my favorites, some of those things that you, uh, that make you feel very fortunate to get to travel. The Bay's main town, also called Kotor, has been protected from centuries of would-be invaders by its imposing wall. Its fortifications begin as stout ramparts along the waterfront, then climb up and up to control the strategic high ground. Kotor's harbor is now a hit with recreational yachters. Its gate welcomes visitors into the old town in a main square busy with cafes. It's worn of tangled alleys and hidden squares seem custom made for exploring. From Kotor, a small road zigzags 25 times high above the sea, up through the clouds, and into the historic heartland of this country. The old road, little more than an overgrown donkey path, was once the mountain kingdom's umbilical cord to the Adriatic. Cresting the ridge, we enter another world, an inhospitable land of rocks, scrub brush, and ramshackle farmhouses. The black mountains that define this basin gave this country its name, Montenegro. So just a couple notes on that. Um, first of all, another thing that kind of shapes our TV show sometimes is Rick's own sense of nostalgia and that he came to this area, not with me in 2007, but I think it was when he was a backpacker. I think it was the 1970s maybe, when he was a very young man. And he saw that, you, they, we just showed that little road, that donkey path that climbs up into the interior of Montenegro. And apparently years ago, Rick saw that and he heard some story, which didn't make the cut for the show, heard some story about how some Duke who lived in the town of Cetinia, which is deep in the interior, he wanted a grand piano for his palace. And so he heard a story, Rick, when he was a young man, of them hauling a grand piano up that little trail that you saw climbing up the mountain. And it, it just captured his imagination. And he was very excited when we came here to film this little piece. You know, I was mainly interested in the coastal part that we saw earlier, but he wanted to show that part of Montenegro too. And in fact, we filmed a lot more than you just saw. So one thing I'm very excited to tell you is at the end of the show, in just, uh, you know, 20 or 30 minutes, we're going to be watching a deleted scene. There was a lot more about Montenegro, including that interior part of Montenegro that we filmed that ended up on the cutting room floor. So stay tuned after this main part of the show, we've re we've resurrected a special rarely seen deleted scene that really gets more into Montenegro um, that I'll be very excited to show you. But for now, we've now done our first two countries. So we've done Dubrovnik, the little tip of Croatia. We've done Montenegro, and now we're moving into our third country, Bosnia-Herzegovina. The landscape changes once again as we cross into yet another country, Bosnia-Herzegovina, or Bosnia for short. And I'll just say before we launch into this part, um, what you're about to watch, this is really kind of the, the core of this show. I mentioned at the top of the show, this is an educational show. Yes, it's a travel show, but we also wanted to use this as a chance to help people understand the former Yugoslavia and all the complexities of it. And so we worked, I mean, we really sweated the details about uh, how we were, what we were about to explain and how we were going to explain it. And it was really important to us in particular not to take sides because I think it's there's a great temptation, especially when there's more than two sides, there's multiple sides to kind of gravitate to one or another. And so we thought, you know, Rick, Rick really believes in the idea of dual narrative. If there's two sides, we want to provide both narratives. So you have the chance as an independent thinker and a traveler to, you know, decide for yourself what resonates with you. Um, in this case, there's actually three different uh, um, uh, uh, narratives. So uh, this is, you'll see now, what, what you'll see here was a product of a lot of hard work on the part of Rick and me and Simon and Carl to really think this through. A little bit later on, as part of the segment we're about to watch, you'll also see my, my, my official TV premiere as a much, much younger man. Um, so you can look forward to that. When we're done sort of talking about all this, I'll pause again. We'll talk a little bit more about how we tried to kind of parse this complicated story. Before we get into Bosnia, let's review the big picture. Every place we're visiting on this trip was part of Yugoslavia, which means literally the land or union of the South Slavic peoples. The country of Yugoslavia lasted roughly from the end of World War I until the 1990s. While its ethnic makeup shaped its recent history, 
the differences between its groups can be subtle and confusing. That's because the major ethnicities of Yugoslavia were all South Slavs. They have the same ancestors and speak closely related languages. The defining difference is that they adopted different religions, brought here over the centuries by various emperors, missionaries, bishops, and sultans. Catholic South Slavs are called Croats, Orthodox Christian South Slavs are called Serbs, and Muslim South Slavs are called Bosniaks. For the most part, there's no way that a casual visitor can determine the religion or loyalties of the people just by looking at them. So we can better understand this troubled union, I'm joined by my friend and co-author of my guidebook to this region, Cameron Hewitt. It just seems like an unlikely union. Oh, well, it was extremely unlikely. You had all these different groups in this one territory. There's only one person who was able to hold it together successfully. That was Marshal Tito, who ruled Yugoslavia. He respected all the diversity within the country, but he believed above all in Yugoslav unity. He said that the divisions between the different, different groups should be like the white lines in a marble column. That marble column didn't last very long. No, it didn't last very long. Uh, after Tito died in 1980, this very delicate balance he created started to topple. Different groups started to grab for more power and authority, and before long, the whole thing just fell apart. Now, I've always just thought of it as just a, a place with so much ethnic baggage that it was just, a, without Tito, a bloody mess waiting to happen. And that's definitely one factor. There's no question that this region has a long history of groups not getting along with each other, lots of warfare. On the other hand, that can't be the only reason. There were long periods of peace in their history as well. In this case, you had politicians who were taking advantage of those feelings, manipulating those feelings. It was a combination of those two factors that, that caused Yugoslavia to fall apart in such a violent way. But it's a horrible war. It was a horrific war. I mean, as each group tried to grab for more of what they thought was their territory, this is the conflict that introduced the term ethnic cleansing into our vocabulary. And much of the worst happened here in Bosnia. That's because this was Yugoslavia's crossroads of cultures. Looking at the architecture, you can see this is where its three major ethnicities, Catholic Croats, Orthodox Serbs, and Muslim Bosniaks all came together. In the 1990s, Bosnia was ripped apart by a three-way war between these groups. So after a few bloody years of fighting, all the different factions across Yugoslavia finally laid down their arms and agreed to peace accords in 1995. Uh, here in Bosnia, they had to actually create a semi-autonomous Serb state within the larger state of Bosnia to preserve that balance. That's pretty weighty stuff. And as you can see, we really were cautious in how we were trying to parse, explain something complicated while at the same time making sure we weren't taking sides. Um, and I think it was through that hard, hard work, it, it paid off. We always, I always kind of figure if I get a complaint on one side of an issue and a complaint on the other side of the issue, it means we probably found the middle ground. Um, quite notably, I, as I recall, when this show came out, we were concerned, we wondered, are we going to get people who are complaining and negative and, and lots of angry criticism? As it turns out, we didn't get much negative criticism at all. So I felt like that was, for us, a mark of success that we'd at least managed um, in, in being even-handed about it. I will say, you might have noticed that they gave me a lot of lines in this episode, and Rick and Simon were joking as we were sorting through the script, how are we going to cover these complicated things? Anytime something started to feel really dicey and controversial, they got to, they started joking, half joking. Well, let, they'll let Cameron say that. Cameron can say all of that stuff. And Simon started to refer to me as crosshairs Cameron. Like every time I showed up on screen, they would superimpose a crosshairs on me because people would be really angry and I'll be kind of the, the easy target. So Rick doesn't have to say this stuff that might offend people. But I will say, this is the great thing about being part of such a smart, conscientious team that has so much experience educating public television viewers about this stuff. Between the three of us, and especially with Rick and Simon's expertise, we knew exactly how to parse it to make sure we were doing it thoughtfully. Um, and I feel like uh, we were successful in that regard. The last thing I'll say, this is a little bit of a tangent, but uh, I was watching that again and really struck at the idea that yes, there are these underlying tensions, but you also had politicians who were kind of throwing gasoline on the fire. And it's, it's really, um, frankly, it's something I've been thinking a lot about the last few years as the temperature has kind of gone up on, on really on both sides, but a lot of it coming, I think, in particular from one, one national political figure. I think a lot about Yugoslavia, and there's this idea that Yugoslavia was a powder keg and it was going to blow at any minute. But if you really understand the history, they had long periods, decades long periods where there was peace and there was coexistence. And it wasn't until a politician came in who realized, for my personal gain, I can really 
take advantage of all of these underlying tensions. Again, the best metaphor is there are these embers that are kind of always glowing. And when somebody who's a politician, whose responsibility is supposed to be being a caretaker and being a, a governing thoughtfully and conscientiously and taking care of the people, when instead they say, I'm going to start throwing gasoline on those embers for my own political gain or for my own agenda, that's when these things get destabilized and can become very explosive. And I, I really believe that's what happened in Yugoslavia. And it makes me sad to see kind of the way our politics in our country have gone in recent years. In fact, a lot of my friends who live in the former Yugoslavia, friends from Slovenia and Croatia, in the last few years have been reaching out to me and saying to me, you know, I'm a little worried when I see what's happening in the United States right now, because it feels not drastically different from what was going on where I grew up in the 1990s. Um, and so even people from the former Yugoslavia, I think, are watching what we're doing with some alarm here in this country, particularly as we enter an election year. Okay, we're going to move on and we're going to talk now about the Serb part, the Serb Republic part of Bosnia, which is a part of the country and the culture that often gets overlooked um, by tourists. A lot of tourists spend a lot of time in Croatia and maybe they dip into Mostar, which we'll get to a little bit later, which is a more Muslim Bosniak part. And they kind of skip right past. Sometimes they literally drive right through this third part. There's a whole big uh, area of this of this area where the, the dominant population are Serbs. And we really wanted to have that balance. So we made a point to go to a town that's a Serb town and talk to some people there as well. So that's what you're about to see here. Trebinja, nestled along a river in a fertile valley, is a showcase town of the semi-autonomous Serb state called Republika Srpska. Exploring it, Cameron and I see a hardworking community offering the foreigner a warm, if curious, welcome. At first, Trebinja felt a bit inaccessible, quite different from my hometown. Yet the more I observed, the more it seemed essentially the same. Teens enjoy prom photos posted in the photography studio's window. Parents give driving lessons in the park. And little girls love a visit to the snack shack. As always, travel humanizes a distant land. A grand Orthodox church caps a hill high above Trebinja. Its interior is rich with symbolism. While newly painted, the medieval feel of the church is a reminder that the Eastern Orthodox faith steadfastly carries on the earliest traditions of Christianity in a modern world. Father Drajan takes a few moments to clue me in. When I come to this church as a Western uh, Christian, it feels very Eastern. Why, sure. why is that? <laughs> well, because it is an Eastern church, and here, uh, Eastern Orthodoxy, uh, is the biggest Christian community. What makes you a Serb? Well, first, Serbs are a nation. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's something that has to do with our genes, with our, with our families, with our background. But as Christians, we would say that our Christian Orthodox faith is also something that makes us Serbs. And as a believer and as a priest, I would say that a real Serb is an Orthodox Christian Serb. So the Serbian Republic here in Bosnia-Herzegovina is Serbian Orthodox? The majority of, of population belong to our Serbian Orthodox Church. In America, we have a word, Balkanization. It means everybody's fighting and just nobody gets along. And that's this area here. Why is that? Obviously, there was a problem. And Balkanization, as you mentioned, is something that has to be uh, slowly overcome and we as a church I think we have a specific role in, in, in reconciliation. One last question. What's this ostrich egg? Well it brings life so in Orthodox tradition it symbolizes resurrection. There you go. And I'll just mention um, we were we felt like as I said we're very felt it was very important to talk to some people from the Serb community to see this beautiful church when we showed up at that church, we knew this there was a beautiful church and it would be a good place to talk about the Orthodox faith, but we weren't sure who we'd find there. This is a case, unlike other places I mentioned, where Rick recreated conversations he's had previously. In this case, we pulled up to this church and just kind of went in and said, is there anyone who's willing to talk to us? And it was, it felt like a miracle. You had Father Drajan, who just we just heard from, who so beautifully spoke about what it means to be a Serb and, and, and the place that religion has in their lives. 
And it just so happens he he was there that day and he had just returned. I want to say it was Cleveland. He had just spent a year or two studying abroad in Cleveland or somewhere in the upper Midwest and has this beautiful English in, in an accent that's fascinating to listen to and was able to, in such an articulate way, um, talk about that. So, so that was one of those, unlike some of these things where Rick kind of was like, okay, say what you told me two years ago. This was the opposite. This was these beautiful serendipities that we find when we're making our TV shows. And it's the combination of those two things that you see on the screen. Exploring the countryside, we find more reminders of the natural beauty and the humanity of this obscure corner of Europe. Heading west, we approach the ethnic boundary, Europe's cultural fault line. We're leaving the Serbian Republic and entering the half of Bosnia shared by Muslims and Croats. Patriotic symbols remind those driving where loyalties lie. Illustrating the cultural divide, the Serbs' Cyrillic alphabet gives way to more familiar letters. And I'll just pause briefly in the middle of this, which is a very important point, um, to just reflect on this sign that you're looking at right now. For the most part, we felt very welcome everywhere that we filmed when we made this show, even though we were covering some dicey topics. This was an interesting exception. We pulled it, we were looking for a sign like this because we wanted to show, you could see in each of the town names, the first name is in Cyrillic and the second name uses our Roman alphabet. In fact, in some parts of, of this part of Bosnia, you might see one of those alphabets scratched out depending on the proclivities of the people in that particular town. In this case, it had both. And we were trying to make this point. You're kind of at a, at a dividing line in Europe. This is where you're moving from Cyrillic Europe to Roman Europe, from Orthodox Europe to, to Christian Muslim Europe and so forth. Um, we were pulled over at the side of the road and Simon and Carl hopped out with their camera to film this exact shot you're looking at right here. And Rick and I were back in the car looking at the script. And suddenly a little car screeched to a halt in the middle of the road and skidded on some gravel. And this giant guy came out of this tiny little car, kind of a skinhead guy, and started shouting at Simon and Carl, wagging his finger. And they are such professionals. They can kind of take anything. They just kind of did what they normally do. They smiled and they wanted to explain what we're doing. And the guy wasn't having it. So he barked at him and yelled at him and basically chased them back to the van where Rick and I were waiting, like had to grab their stuff and run back to the van before this guy followed them. Um, and we were really kind of shaken up by it. Well, we were talking to some our local contacts a little bit later about it. And they said, well, you know what happened was in this particular town, a tour, you know, a year or two earlier, some film crew had come through and they had shot a documentary that was that was not even handed. They, they were not trying to be educational. It was very one sided in a way that was unflattering to local people. So in this particular town, we had no idea people were very sensitive to being filmed because they were like, we're not gonna let you make more propaganda about us like you have been. Um, so that's very rare. And all the filming I've done, and as far as I know from, from Simon and Carl and all the filming they've done, that's almost never happened. But this is one case where uh, we, we, it was a little bit scary for a moment. All right, we're gonna carry on now into Mostar. And a mountaintop castle guarding the pass suggests that this has long been a point where different cultures merge. Mostar, straddling its beloved river, is the leading city of the southern part of Bosnia-Herzegovina. Mostar feels Turkish because, until the early 20th century, it belonged to the Ottoman Empire. When the Ottomans vacated, they left behind a large population of Muslim converts. You feel this Turkish heritage everywhere. It's embodied in a skyline of minarets and in the five times daily call to prayer. And Mostar's 400-year-old stone bridge was commissioned by Sultan Suleiman the Magnificent. With its elegant single-pointed arch, the old bridge symbolized the town's status as the place where East meets West in Europe. When it was part of Yugoslavia, as in centuries past, Mostar was a place where cultures mingled, where Catholic Croats, Orthodox Serbs, and Muslim Bosniaks lived together in relative harmony. But then, as Yugoslavia fell apart in the 1990s, Mostar itself became embroiled in war. Neighbors and friends took up arms against each other. First, Croats and Bosniaks forced out the Serbs. Then, the two remaining groups set their guns on each other, establishing a bloody front line that cut right through the center of this town. So Rick's about to introduce Alma, um, who you see on the screen there. She's about to tell us her story. And I just wanted to pause and just say, 
Alma is another one of these wonderful people that we get to meet through working on our guidebooks and leading our tours. She was a local guide on our tours for many years in Mostar, who it's just such a privilege to be able to introduce her to the American viewing audience. Um, Alma and I have been very good friends for many years. This was maybe the second or third time I met her that we filmed this, but ever since, every time I'm back in Mostar, I spend time with Alma. One time she took me to a, um, a cafe and she described to me the process of drinking Turkish coffee, which we might, or Bosnian coffee. We think of it as Turkish coffee, but it's they call it Bosnian coffee there. And she did this beautiful job of explaining why drinking this unfiltered coffee is a social ritual as much as it is a drink. And I loved it so much. I wrote a travel memoir a few years ago called The Temporary European. And I introduced my whole book with a story uh, about Alma, who you see on your screen here, telling me about Bosnian coffee and what it means to her culture. I just find people like Alma are just they're the people who bring the joy to your travels. And just for fun, before we continue, I wanted to show you kind of a where are they now picture. This is a picture of me and Alma, uh, a little bit older and a little bit grayer when I saw her when I was back in this area about a year and a half ago. So Alma's still out there doing some amazing guiding. And as you're about to see, she really beautifully, beautifully tells the story of her own experience, uh, very, very uh, powerfully, her own experience as somebody who lived in Mostar in the 1990s as it was torn apart by war. So please listen to Alma really um, revealing a lot about what it's like to live through this, this terrible thing that we saw in the headlines. Locals, like tour guide Alma Alezovic, lived under siege during that frightening time. You must have powerful memories of living during the war, living through the war. Yes, you know, we are Muslim and that was our flat here. We, we, we lived here all the time when war started. So when war started, they cut electricity, cut everything. So it was totally dark. It was like we back 500 years back, you know, and during the day they shelling, they send us million grenades and bullets. We have to stop. We have to uh, find a shelter, protect us and our family. But evenings uh, bring a new duties. You have to find water. You have to find food, br uh, see the friends, etc. So. I remember I have to wear it, uh, black things because of snipers uh, uh, watches all the time, 24 hours. So there hours. were Croat snipers exactly. over here shooting exactly. this Exactly. Was your family okay? Yes, thanks God my family was okay. But many of my friends been killed here. And uh, two friends actually died here, just here. This street was, it's very symbolic to us. Uh, we live on this street and die on this street. This is a very special place for us. Uh, it was a park before war where lovers gather, children gather, and sitting here have a nice time. But in the war, we mustn't go to the cemeteries because uh, it was uh, exposed too much to the snipers. We have to come here and bury people. Actually, we have to uh, 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 transform parks in a cemeteries. In all of the dates, 1993? Yes, uh, I think 90% of these graves are from 93. Very young people. The conflict reached its peak with a symbolic moment that resonated around the world. This venerable bridge was pummeled by artillery shells from the hilltop above until finally it collapsed into the river. While the city has been at peace now since 1995, the sectarian symbolism remains powerful. Still, both religious communities seem determined to build upon this fragile reconciliation. The ten minarets, rebuilt since the war, once again pierce Mostar's skyline like Muslim exclamation points. Each Friday, the town's mosques are busy with worshippers. Across town, twice as high as the tallest minaret, towers the Croats' Catholic church spire. Like the mosques, this new church is busy serving the faithful in its community. Observing this, it occurred to me that I've never met anyone from either community here who called the war anything but a tragic mistake. I just want to repeat what Rick said because he he said this to me when we were traveling here and it's it's frankly stuck in my in my heart ever since and it really rings true to me. Nobody I've ever met here has ever said to me that this war was anything other than a tragic mistake. And I think it, that's it just gives me chills thinking about it and it's when you travel if you travel to a place that's been racked by war. It's what's very consistent is the the vast majority of people 
are people who never wanted that war. And they're the ones whose lives, lives get turned upside down. They're the ones who get hurt. They're the ones who are traumatized for the rest of their lives, people like Alma. Um, and it's it's interesting watching this. It's I think it's a little reckless to draw too many parallels between different conflicts. But I'm I'm thinking about this, but I'm also thinking about other wars that we've been seeing in the news lately, the Israelis and Palestinians, and we've, you know, thinking about Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And it's 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 very interesting that um in this war and in a lot of wars, it almost seems like the war is waged by people who are convinced that two wrongs will eventually make a right. And in fact, both sides are determined to convince everybody that they had the oldest or the biggest wrong in their side, and therefore they're justified in having an even bigger wrong. And it just escalates. You get basically this, this pileup of wrongs against each other. And who are the victims? Not the people who are believing these things. It's the people like Alma, the everyday people who are just trying to live their lives and raise their kids and live in peace. Um, and I think when you travel to a place like this, it gives you a perspective, not only on this conflict, but in, in all of these conflicts. And it breaks your heart. It makes you just root for people. When Russia invaded Ukraine, I was watching that. And all I could think about are there's going to be a whole generation of millions of Ukrainians who are going to be scarred in the same way that all of these Bosnians who lived through this 30 years ago were scarred. And it it's just war is a diplomatic failure and a tragic mistake, according to almost everybody in retrospect. Mostar is rebuilding. It's moving on, and those ethnic divisions are gradually fading. Soon after the war, the old bridge was rebuilt using the original materials. The new old bridge was immediately embraced as a promising sign of reconciliation. And today, as they have for generations, young Mostarians jump from the bridge. Divers make a ruckus collecting donations at the top of the bridge. They tease and they tease, asking for more money, and more money, and more money. Finally, they take the 75-foot plunge. Leading up the hill from the old bridge is Coppersmith Street, a lively shopping zone with the flavor of a Turkish bazaar. You'll find hammered copper decorations, artists' galleries, and a local twist, old Yugoslav army kitsch. And in the evening, restaurants along Coppersmith Street and the rest of Mostar's riverfront clamor for your business. Grilled meats are big here, including shish kebabs and the little sausage links called chevapchichi. And everything tastes better with a dab of Ivar. That's a condiment made of eggplant and red pepper, like Bosnian ketchup with a kick. One thing I wanted to note here, um, this is a pretty heavy episode as we're learning. There's a lot of substantial recent history to cover here. But I also hope this is also a travel show. And I also hope from watching, especially that last little segment, you're getting the impression, which would be accurate, that Bosnia is also just a wonderful place to travel. It is a fantastic destination. You've got great food. You've got beautiful landmarks. You've got wonderful people. Yes, you've got complicated history, um, but you also have this kind of Turkish flavor. You've got Muslim culture. Bosnia is wonderful. Mostar is wonderful. I think of Mostar, much as I love it, is sort of Bosnia with training wheels, right? So if you're in Croatia and you want just a little taste of Bosnia, you can go to Mostar, what we've seen here, and you'll get a really good sense of what it's like. If you're interested in Mostar or you think you would like Mostar, I would suggest going beyond it. Uh, we didn't get to Sarajevo in this show. This is the capital of Bosnia. It's about two and a half hour drive or train ride up the road from Mostar. It's like everything that you see here in Mostar on a much grander scale. It's even more beautiful. It's even more interesting. It's even more culturally rich. It's even more diverse. It's even more fascinating recent history. It's even friendlier people. It's even better food. Um, whether it's Mostar or Sarajevo or anything else in Bosnia, I hope one of the things you take away from watching this show is Bosnia is one of the great underrated destinations in Europe and really worth a visit. An after-dinner stroll inspires confidence in this region's ability to heal its wounds. Young and old, everyone's out embracing life. Masala Square, literally the place of prayer, is designed for big gatherings. And tonight, 
The students are out and Bosnian hormones are raging. Being young and sexy is a great equalizer. These 20-something Bosnians were toddlers during the war. Seeing them tonight, it's clear. They're looking forward to a bright and promising future. So I think that's a nice message of hope and reconciliation to finish out this episode. Um, it's funny, this was another moment that Rick had had a serendipitous experience before we filmed when he was here on the guidebook. He stumbled into this party where all these young people were out having a great time and he just thought that was really uplifting. So he sent the crew out when we got there and said, find a bunch of young people uh, who are out having fun so that we can kind of capture this. But I think it really does convey the idea. Think about it, all these people you see here, and this was already 15 years ago, they were all toddlers when the war was happening. So for them, it's something that they don't remember, don't remember very well. Um, I have a couple of interesting stories about reconciliation. You know, Bosnia is somewhat safe and stable. The government that they created in order to end the war isn't particularly feasible for a country that's trying to move forward. So there's they're kind of in this weird uh, situation where the government is keeping the peace, but realistically, they can't really move forward with what they've got. But as individuals, Bosnians, I think for the most part, are really looking forward and, and trying to get along with each other. And I would say there's two little stories I'd love to tell you about that illustrate that. One is that the day after we filmed this, I had to go do some guidebook research up in Sweden. So I had to get from Mostar to split Croatia to fly up to Sweden. And Alma's husband said, hey, I'll drive you into the airport and split. And by the way, do you mind if my teenager comes along? And Alma and her husband, Ermin, they have this wonderful, uh, at the time, teenager named Yaz, short for Yasmin. And Yaz had been a little baby during the war. And I said, sure, of course Yaz can come. So I was in the front seat with Ehrman. In the back seat, you had Yaz and his buddy from high school at the time they were in high school. And his buddy was a Croat. And this is, as you've seen in this show, this was a divided city, even in the 90s, even today to a certain degree. Most are divided down the middle between Muslims and Croats. But the communities 15 years after the war and even now more so today are starting to mix. And I just thought this is a really, after we kind of had been through the ringer trying to explain this to our read, our viewers, it was really uplifting to be driving three hours to split with a Croat and a Bosnian, Bosniak in the back seat and their buddies and they're hanging out together. And then the other thing I'll tell you is that same young man, Yaz, is now an adult. And when I saw Alma a year and a half ago, she gave me the very happy news that Yaz has married. And in fact, the woman he married is a member also of the Croat community. So there again, in Mostar, Mostar uh, Alma's son married a Croat, Muslim Croat coming together. Um, there is still some tension in this society, but it is a sign that things are, are getting better. And I think that's what we wanted to leave people with this idea that um, ideally you can move forward. All right, let's finish up this show. And I'm gonna pause one more time during the bloopers to point something out. While travel in the Balkans has its challenges, it's also deeply rewarding. The history is complex and the problems are many but solutions are emerging. Thanks for joining us. I'm Rick Steves. Until next time, keep on traveling. All right, we're okay. A local fisherman found an icon of the Virgin Mary stranded on a reef, believe it or not. It's, whoa, it's so cool. Nothing looks right without some wildflowers held by Cameron Hewitt. Hey, there I am. <laughs> <laughs> remember I said at the beginning those wildflowers that were perfectly situated in the frame I said to remember that uh no this was I thought this was a very dignified way to begin my career in public television <laughs> no but in all seriousness I think this illustrates there's no ego on a film shoot right like and it's true whether it's Rick or Simon or me or Carl or anybody if something needs to be done you're going to get down on your knees and do it you're going to you're going to get dirty in the mud and hold up those flowers so it makes the frame just perfect um, that's part of TV. You know, Simon carries the gear even as he's producing and directing the show. Uh, Carl wears the uh, the sound gear even as he's filming through his, his camera. Uh, we all chip in together to make the best show possible, even if that means sometimes crouching down just out of frame and holding up wildflowers. Let's hear it for our flower grip. <laughs> oh, nice bum. <laughs> So um, that's the end of the show. But before we get into Q&A, we're going to take a few minutes for questions and answers in just a moment. But first, I promised you 
a special, very rarely seen, it's not never before seen, but it's almost never before seen, deleted scene. We just saw this beautiful show about Dubrovnik, Montenegro, and Mostar. And you might've noticed that Montenegro felt a little squeezed. It didn't get quite as much airtime. We filmed a beautiful segment in the interior of Montenegro. And as often happens, we ended up with more material than we needed at the end of the shoot, and we had to trim some time. So you're about to watch a two or three minute clip of what we had to cut out of Montenegro. And you'll notice, you might notice in the show, we talked to Pero, who is um, a Croat. We talked to Father Drajan, who's a Serb. And we talked to Alma, who's a Muslim. We didn't get to talk to a Montenegrin, except that we did. We just had to cut it out. So you'll also get to meet in this clip Stefan Jukanovic, who's another good friend of mine, who's a tour guide in KOTOR. In fact, I just uh, emailed him a question about a trip I have coming up later this year. So enjoy this little bonus clip from this episode. The Black Mountains that define this basin gave this country its name, Montenegro. The road leads to Sintinia, the old royal capital back when this kingdom was a mountain stronghold. Today, Sintinia is a workaday two-story town. There's barely a hint of its former status other than the Montenegrin president's official residence. Former embassies sit vacant. While the economy feels flat, life goes on. To better understand this scene, I'm joined by local guide Stefan Dukanovic, who points out that while the king's long gone, the town remains the religious capital of his country. Its Orthodox monastery, the still-beating spiritual heart of Montenegro, is dedicated to St. Peter of Sintinia, a 12th century local priest who inspired his people to defend Christianity against the Muslims. This is a glorious screen. Yeah, it is. Actually, it's the iconostasis, you know, place where just priests can go in time of service, and that's typical for um, Orthodox churches. And uh, most of people from Montenegro are actually Serbian Orthodox Christians. Here in this church, we can see also some very, very important relics, not just from Montenegro, but we can see from the Christians from whole parts of the world, because uh, here in front of us, we can see uh, the right hand of Saint John the Baptist. So that important relic kind of substantiates the fact that this is the most important religious place in Montenegro. Exactly. This exactly. church. Tucked between the rugged peaks, communities and fertile valleys offer more insights into this persistent culture. Humble Montenegrin towns, like Negosi, seem quiet, but there's industry where you might not expect it. There's a lot of ham. Yeah, a lot of ham and a lot of smoke, as you can see. Actually, what makes hams from Montenegro different than the hams from the, we can say, other part of the Mediterranean coast is actually the process of smoking. Because 15 days, 24 hours per day, they're putting the smoke right here. They use just beech wood for, 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 for the smoke uh, from local national park. And that gives, we can say, the special taste to the hams from this village in Yagoshi. So after 15 days of smoking, uh, next 11 months, they are drying the meat just on the air. And every 10 or 15 days, you know, people who are doing that, that process are testing actually if the meat is good. They take like a wooden sticks which they put inside of the meat, pull it out and they, uh, they smell if the meat is good and by the smell they can feel if the process is okay. All right, so that's just a little bonus for those of you who've stuck through this whole episode. And I got to tell you, we were in that, we walked into that hut where they were steaming all of these uh, cured hams. When I see that clip, I can still close my eyes. You know what that rich beach, beach smoke smells like? You can imagine like it's like walking into a smoker. Um, and it, it was walking into a smoker. And I, every time I see that clip, I can just, I can smell the smoke. Just, just, I think we all smelled like smoke for a week. And it was a shame we weren't able to uh, include that in the show, um, but that's that's television. And we do try to rescue little bits and pieces like that for this kind of thing that we did here tonight. Um, well, thank you all for watching. We're gonna do um, a Q&A here in a moment. Is that right, Ben? That is right, Cameron. Thank you so much for so beautifully and articulately presenting the complexity of this region. Very well done, thank you. Thank you. Before we get to some questions though, Cameron, can you share the word from our sponsor for tonight? Yes, I can, in fact. So um, just uh, recently, we published the 40th edition 
of our guidebook, Europe Through the Back Door. And if you know anything about Rick Steves, that's our sort of our flagship travel skills handbook, 40 editions of Europe Through the Back Door. And we said, we can't let this go without a little celebration. So this month for March, we are celebrating as a company, the 40th anniversary of Rick's first book. And I have, this is actually the second edition, not the first one, but it's very precious. This was the original cover of Europe, Rick's self-published Europe Through the Back Door. And so we're kind of using this month as a chance to sort of do a retrospective, not just on that book, but on our company's history. We really strongly believe that we're part of a merry band of travelers. We all work together with Rick to bring the best of travel to all of you, and we consider you part of our family. And one thing we're really excited about, I have spent quite a bit of time on this personally recently. We have got a really fun website that we've started just a few days ago. And it's, you know, like an advent calendar where every day you get to open a new door. This is like an advent calendar for Rick Steves for the month of March. So if you look each of these beautiful old doors, if you click on each one, you get to find a little bit of company history, Rick Steves heritage. And very often, like in this case, you get a link out to a new article that we just wrote um, a couple of weeks ago, celebrating your through the back door at age 40. And this is just a really fun way for us to celebrate together. Rick kind of kicks it off on day one with a little introductory video. Hey, I'm Rick Steves, and we're having a very special festival month. We are celebrating. And so um, just stay tuned. We've only got three of those doors open, but every day through March, we're going to keep on opening these doors, and you can learn a little bit more, lots of fun little bits and pieces about our company heritage and about, about Rick in general. And we have another special treat this month. Ben, do you have this ready to model? I do. Well, I'll sort of model it. I'm not wearing it, but... <laughs> We have a special limited edition Europe Through the Back Door t-shirt. This is the original logo, is that right? This yeah. is the original logo from in 1980 was the year that the first book was published. So this is the vintage logo, the retro Rick Steves t-shirt. And my favorite part is the back of the shirt. Oh man, that's great. Look at that. That's a classic Dave Herline map with lots of great little Easter eggs hidden out throughout. And this is... For sale just starting today, isn't that right, Cameron? We uh -huh. literally just got an email from Julie, our, our, uh, our, our merchandiser, a couple of hours ago that it's officially on sale. So if you want to celebrate with us this month, go to that advent calendar that we just showed you. Every day you can get a little bit of new piece of information and consider picking up one of those t-shirts to, to, uh, to celebrate along with us the 40th edition of Year Through the Back Door. Excellent. Thank you, Cameron. I look forward to wearing that t-shirt very soon myself. All right. Let's get to some questions. Gabe has been kindly sorting through them for me. The first one comes from Kathy. Cameron, in your opinion, what is the best way for travelers to connect with locals in this region? You know, I find people in this region are very social. They love to chat. They Everyone in all of these countries speaks outstanding English because they're little countries. So like, you know, if you're Croatian or Slovene or Bosnian, you know that most of the world isn't going to learn Croatian or Slovene or Bosnian to talk to you. So they all speak, they start learning English, I think now second or third grade, every Croatian second grader learns how to speak English. They speak great English. They're often very eager to share with you their um, opinions and their, and their stories from their past. Um, I would say it's not a hard place to connect with people, just, you know, like you would anywhere, sit down on a bench next, next to somebody and ask them a question. One of my favorite little things is if I'm on a train with somebody or a bus, and everybody in the compartment's really quiet. No one's talking. I'll just take out a bag of snacks and I'll open it up and I'll offer it around. And I find all that's all it takes. I was in a, a train car in Poland once and there were six of us all stone faced for the first half hour. And then I got out a bag of pretzels and I handed it around. We spent the next two and a half hours talking to each other nonstop. Just little icebreakers like that. Um, if you really want to dig in, though, to the history and the heritage, it's worth hiring a local guide in a lot of these places, particularly somewhere like most star or Sarajevo or even Dubrovnik that has a complicated history. If you want to, you know, those beautiful little um, casual encounters are great. But if you want someone to really take you by the hand and show you some of the sites and tell you in a more serious way the history, it's very affordable in these countries to hire a local guide. And in our Croatia guidebook, we've got um, our favorite guides like Alma. We've got Alma's email address in here. So you can write to her ahead of time and arrange to have her come and meet you. And you can have that experience Rick did walking through the streets of Mostar with her. That's a good way to, if you really want to um, have an, an even more 
sustained period with a local person. I love that tip about sharing food on the public transit, Cameron. That's genius, genius. Uh, Don is curious, for some of the side trips or others from Dubrovnik, should you rent a car? Should you hire a private driver? What do you suggest? That's a great question. You can, you, these are pretty easy places to drive. So I would say I wouldn't hesitate to rent a car if you're comfortable driving. They tend to have good roads and we've got self-guided driving tours in our books and the borders, you do cross borders, but they're a generally pretty straightforward other than you might have to wait a little bit on a busy summer weekend. Um, so that's one option. Another option is, yeah, in Dubrovnik, in our book, again, we recommend several private drivers you can hire for the day. And it's usually about 300 euros, including a tip. And that's for all day. And it's for up to four people. You can split it two or four ways if you want to. And they're used to doing this. They'll pick you up at your hotel at eight in the morning, and they'll take you either to Montenegro to see the Bay of Kotor, or they can take you all the way to Mostar and back and bring you back to Dubrovnik. And for you know 300 euros for a very full day, that's that's a good value, especially when you can split it with a small group. Um, but you know, if you want to too, there's buses. I've taken the public bus from Dubrovnik to Mostar or Dubrovnik to to um, to Montenegro to Kotor. Um, public transportation is also possible. It's a little slower, and you don't get to stop along the way. But if if you just want to go from Dubrovnik to Mostar, there's buses that go eight or ten times a day, and it takes two or three hours. So you have a lot of options for for connecting the dots. Susanna is curious if neighbor Italy, big neighbor Italy, has had any influence on the area we've been discussing tonight, Cameron. Absolutely, and yeah. And I think especially, today? yeah, especially Croatia. Um, and so in our other show on Croatia, we do talk a little bit more about, especially Venice, if you think about it, this is the Adriatic coast. And so for much of history, it was controlled by Venice, specifically by Venice. Italy didn't exist as a country until the 19th century. Um, and so every little town in Croatia has a Venetian style bell tower, like a campanile, like the giant bell tower on St. Mark's Square. There's a miniature campanile in every town in Croatia. And, and so you really definitely feel partly architecturally that heritage. You also kind of feel it in the, the food and you feel it in the culture a little bit. Um, you know, so yes, there's, there's a, a tremendous amount of influence back and forth between Croatia and other parts of the Adriatic, specifically Venice. George asks about visiting islands off the coast of Dubrovnik. There are ferries, right, Cameron? And yes. And you have to be yep. booked ahead. Yeah, I would book them, especially the summer. It can be very popular. There's, um, it, whether if you're going to the little islands that are very close to Dubrovnik, the ones that are just a five or a 10 or a 15 minute boat ride, those go kind of constantly. And you can even just book it the night before, even the morning of. But if you want to do some island hopping, if let's say you want to go from Dubrovnik to Korchula, to Hvar and then up to Split. These are all places that are covered in our other show on Croatia. It's a good idea to research those schedules ahead of time and ideally to book them ahead of time because they do sell out. You don't have to book them months ahead of time. Um, but I, when I'm traveling there, I kind of keep an eye on what my options are and I book two or three days ahead, you know, so I can have a little bit of flexibility. Um, if I see that they're starting to sell out, I'll kind of jump on it and buy my ticket. Um, but yeah, there's 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 lots of great ways to to connect the dots along the Croatian coastline. Excellent tips. Thank you, Cameron. We have time for just one more question. You mentioned earlier that you're returning to this region later this year. Can you tell us a little more about your 2024 travel plans? I am. I'm, I'm just getting all my trip plans figured out. And first I'm starting in, by the way, if you're curious, in April, I'm going to be in Amsterdam and in Venice, updating our guidebooks there. And then in June, I'll be in Slovenia and in Germany. But in the fall, in September, I'm doing some guidebook research down in Greece. And I've always dreamed of going to some of the other parts of the Balkans. So you just went with me to Dubrovnik and Mostar and Montenegro. I've never been to Albania. I've never been to Macedonia. I've never been to Kosovo. I'd like to know some of those neighboring countries really well. So I'm lacing together for the first time, in some cases, a very ambitious itinerary just on my own. It's not for guidebooks, not for tour, it's not for TV show. It's just for Cameron. Um, but I'm finally going to kind of fill in those gaps in my mental map of Europe. And so I've been really having fun the last few weeks trying to figure out how do you get from Podgorica, Montenegro to Skopje, Macedonia, to pick up your rental car so you can drive up to Kosovo. You know, there's all these weird connections I'm trying to sort out. And I'm just really excited actually watching this show again and preparing for this today reminded me what a fascinating region this is. And, you know, you got three pieces of the story tonight, but there's 
dozens of other pieces of the story. So um, you're never well traveled enough that you don't want to just keep on going. And uh, that'll be my big challenge the next few months is figuring out the rest of my trips are easy. They're open and shut. But for this thing I'm doing in September, I'm really excited to try to get to some new places. So uh, speaking of new places, I want to thank all of you for joining us tonight on, on, a, on a visit to places that maybe are a little bit less familiar than, than some of the things you'd see uh, on most of the Rick Steve show. Um, thank you so much for your, your, your um, interest. And I hope you'll agree that um, this is a beautiful, fascinating, important part of the world. And the more you know about it, the more you appreciate it. Um, and thank you, Ben, very much for, as usual, your wonderful moderating. Thanks so much, Cameron. We'll be sure to have you back for a trip report on your fall travels. How does that sound? You bet. That's the date. Thanks so much, everyone. Have a great night. We'll see you next week on Monday for Packing with Lisa. That'll be a very fun show. Good night, Cameron. Good night, Ben. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night.